everyone, welcome to The Question Show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down, gather it up, and I will answer them here. Uh, once again, I am recording this show in your past, which is my future. I don't know what will happen. Uh, the date is June 21st, 2021, but all kinds of amazing things might happen over the next week while this episode is being edited. Who can say? Uh, just to let you know, this is also the penultimate episode uh, before I go on my annual summer hiatus from uh, July through July and August. So uh, there'll be like one more question show after this, and then I will be mostly offline for the next two months, although I'll still be doing the newsletter and running universe today. But I won't be doing any live stream either through this through astronomy cast or the weekly space hangout. So uh, just to prepare you emotionally for the fact that I'll be gone for about two months. Uh, all right, let's get uh, into the questions. Estevan Kandel. Hey Fraser, in the hypothetical scenario that our galaxy is bursting with Dyson spheres, what current or future telescope would be able to find out about it? Would we know about it already? So a Dyson sphere, of course, or a Dyson swarm is this theoretical futuristic advanced alien civilization that has fully enclosed their star in some kind of radiation gathering system, whether it's like one big shell, probably not a big shell, because that wouldn't be stable, and it would drift around and would be bad. But probably just like a swarm of solar satellites that are buzzing around the star, they're collecting every single photon that gets out of the sun, they're using it for who knows what computronium They're they're running a giant universe simulation there. This is where I make my crisis three joke. Uh, but who knows what they use all that much power for. Um, but they're doing it. And we can calculate that it will take us, I think about 2300 years from now, to, until the point that you know, if our energy use continues on the upward curve that it does, we will reach the point where the amount of energy that we'll be using is the amount that is emitted by the sun. And so then how do you get all of the radiation that's emitted by the sun you enclose it in some kind of swarm. So that's a Dyson swarm. Is it guaranteed? No, no, absolutely not. Of course, you know, and I'm, there's going to be a certain group of people who are like rolling their eyes at the idea of a Dyson sphere. Like who's to say that we will continue our never ending increasing demand for energy when we can figure out some kind of balance with whatever, right? Who knows, we since the history of mankind have followed an exponential scale of energy usage from really from the beginning, like for the last million years, definitely through the agricultural revolution, definitely through the industrial revolution, our use of energy continues to go up. And so you just take that line and you just continue it on into the future, make little dotted lines where the energy use will go It'll increase and increase and increase and boom, using all the energy of a star. And then if you just keep that line going up, um, about, it doesn't take long, really this the the part that takes the longest is the amount of time that it would take you to actually travel from star to star and put these Dyson spheres around every single star in 100 to 400 billion stars in the entire Milky Way. And that would only take you again, probably about a million years after that. And the, the time is the the travel time, not the construction time. So yeah, in a million years or so, we will have gone from where we are today, to we will put a Dyson swarm around every single star in the entire Milky Way or not, who knows, but it's just it's something to think about. I'm, I'm not saying you should, I'm just saying, let's just think about it. So then if you did that, you would have this swarm enclosing the star, all of the photons of visible light, x ray radiation, heat, are all coming out of the star, they're hitting this Dyson swarm, they're being converted into electricity for some purpose. And then because of the laws of thermodynamics, these things have to give off waste heat. And so they will emit this waste heat in all directions. But effectively, from our perspective, we will see the waste heat signature of a star. And it will have a similar signature to the star itself, because you're essentially getting you know, in the end, you have to get rid of all of that heat. And so you're just really shifting from the visible light x rays, ultraviolet, 
into infrared, and then you're emitting that out into the universe. And we have very powerful, very sophisticated infrared telescopes, and they would absolutely be able to detect a Dyson swarm in our vicinity. Or if the aliens had enclosed every star in their entire galaxy, they would be able to detect the infrared signature of an entire galaxy, it would look utterly different than a galaxy as we imagine today. When you think about some of the most beautiful pictures taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, and you're looking at this incredible galaxy with its spiral arms and, and dust clouds and centers of star formation and globular clusters in the central core. Imagine that whole thing, but now it's just blobs of heat. Every single part of it is heat. You would detect portions of it being turned into Dyson swarms. You would detect the entire galaxy. We give off this very specific signature of Dyson swarms. It would look utterly different. And astronomers have gone and looked for this. They've done surveys both to look for Dyson swarms here in the Milky Way, and they've done surveys to look for galaxy wide Dyson swarms. And so far, none have turned up. So if any alien civilization is in the process of colonizing their entire galaxy, we haven't seen it, or creating some expanding sphere of colonized space through all of the galaxies that they can reach within their observable horizon. We haven't seen that either, we would see that we would see these galaxies are have all turned to the infrared, we could almost measure the size of their empire. And we don't see it so far, no one has seen it. And so Currently, from our perspective, all of the universe that we can see has been unclaimed by Dyson swarm building alien civilizations. That's sort of our current state. And of course, the thing I always like to say is that we, you know, people always say like, oh, we'll never build a Dyson swarm, but we have already begun. When you think about all of the space telescopes that have been built so far by NASA and ESA, and etc, that are orbiting the sun that are harvesting the energy from the sun to power themselves, that is the beginning of our Dyson sphere, we've already begun the construction of our Dyson sphere, the moment we launched our first solar based telescope into space, the construction of our Dyson sphere began. And eventually some future alien civilization will be able to detect it. Francisco sins. Can we harvest 100% of the energy the star produces without leaking or losing in radio or infrared? We get this question a lot. And I guess it's just a follow on question to the whole how can we detect Dyson spheres, which is then like, how can we hide a Dyson sphere? You know, if we've got all of this capability of energy, for storing all of the energy of an entire star, can't we figure out a way to not leak that energy out into space so that aliens can know that where we are. And it's like the one answer is no, no, the laws of thermodynamics say that you have to release heat. And sort of think about it from a logical point, like, if you are gathering all the light coming from the star, and you're enclosing it in a sphere, and you are using that energy for whatever kinds of purpose, and none of that energy is getting out, then you are building an oven, you're just going to have the temperature inside your sphere, rise and rise and rise and rise. And eventually, it's going to be 1000s of degrees and 10s of 1000s of degrees and millions of degrees and billions of degrees as the sun keeps on putting out heat, and you keep on capturing it and not letting it escape out into the universe. And so you have to release that heat somehow. And often, release of heat on a spacecraft is as big or more of a concern than getting energy in the first place. Spacecraft engineers have to think about the release of heat through radiators, just as much they have to consider how much solar panels are going to put on the spacecraft, you can see on the International Space Station, the radiators are, are a huge part of the station. You think there are other solar panels, but they're radiators. So no, you can't as we understand the laws of physics today. Now, I can imagine you could figure out some way that you might be able to lengthen the the waves to push them into the radio so that someone would need a very specific kind of radio telescope to be able to do it. But at the end of the day, you do have to get rid of that heat. I can imagine some other possibility, like maybe you've got a pet black hole, that's also orbiting around inside the star, and then you're gathering up the heat and then you're firing it as a laser into the black hole, and it's absorbing the leftover energy. But still, I mean, even the laser is going to be releasing heat, like you're going to have to have gadgets to collect the heat from things that are collecting the heat. And at the end of the day, we follow the laws of thermodynamics in this universe. So 
Uh, yeah, there's just no way to do it. But if the laws of physics don't work as we understand them, who's to say what will happen in the future? Jay Brodeur, could a Falcon 9 or Heavy reach Hubble and would it be worthwhile to do a servicing mission? So the last time that the Hubble Space Telescope was serviced was with the space shuttle. And it did a couple of servicing operations was able you know that initial repair that fixed the problems with the space shuttle's optics and then follow on missions to replace some of its gyros as they were breaking down as well as upgrade the electronics. And it's sort of ended up being a very useful way to run a space telescope that you can launch the telescope and then you can upgrade it at the same time, the Hubble Space Telescope has been very expensive It was expensive to build. It was very expensive to fly the space shuttle and to do all of those repairs to the Hubble Space Telescope. At the same time, though, of course, James Webb, which won't be repairable, is going to be insanely expensive. So who knows what's the best way to go about this? Could theoretically, a group of astronauts get in board a Crew Dragon 2 uh, on top of a Falcon 9 fly to the Hubble Space Telescope? Yes. Um, the the orbit of the Hubble Space Telescope, it's different from the International Space Station, but it's roughly similar. And so it was designed to be reachable by the space shuttle and it's reachable by a Falcon 9 with a Crew Dragon. But the Crew Dragon doesn't have the same kind of capabilities that the space shuttle did. It doesn't have a wonderful Canadian built robotic arm, it doesn't have the kinds of facilities to allow the astronauts to do spacewalks. It's not really set up for long term, you know, habitation on board the spacecraft, although the Crew Dragon is, is pretty big, like the Crew Dragon is actually about uh, double the volume of the Apollo module. So if you just sent up a couple of astronauts, they would have lots of room to hang out inside. But I can imagine a variant of the Crew Dragon that's designed for orbital resurfacing. And you can imagine if things get to that point, that a Crew Dragon could launch and send a couple of astronauts and it's got some sort of cargo bay doors and it's got a robotic arm that can hold on and they could do a bunch of repairs to the Hubble Space Telescope. And who knows, maybe at some point, that'll be a decision that someone decides to make. The other possibility, of course, is that the Starship could just kind of gulp up the Hubble Space Telescope, bring it back down to Earth inexpensively, they could fix it down on Earth, put it back in Starship, it could fly back up, release it again. So there's a lot of really interesting ideas that will happen when you've got a reusable rocket capable of grabbing things from space and landing back down on Earth. I, mean, again, I don't think we've really explored it. So right now, there are no plans to repair Hubble again. Um, the only plans are to deorbit it when it stops functioning properly. But uh, it's cool to think about. And who knows, at some point, someone will make the cost benefit analysis on whether or not it makes sense to do it. Celestial Navigator, do you think computers will completely replace humans in the field of astronomy? No, no, I don't think computers are going to replace human beings. I think humans have a very important role in the process of astronomy. But at the same time, computers do an enormous amount already. Like astronomers are, are bordering on computer scientists. Like, I don't think they want to admit it. But when you ask them how well they're able to program in various programming languages, they're masters of Python, they're able to comb through databases, they communicate with their telescopes, robotically, programmatically, like they do a ton of computer work to be able to do their jobs. And if you think that you're gonna be able to become an astronomer without learning to also become a computer programmer, you're just fooling yourself. But I really like this idea of of the centaur. And, and the idea is that you've got a you've got a human being working with a computer together as a partnership. And there's things that human beings are very good at. And there's things that that computers are, are very good at and very fast at. And so the trick is, over time, you're able to push more and more of the manual grunt work into the hands of the computer, as opposed to having sort of a human being do it. But that frees your mind to think of new ideas to explore new spaces. And so when you think about it, in the olden days, you might have a astronomy professor with a whole bunch of grad students, and then the professor will be working on some paper, they'll give all of the grunt work to the graduate students, and they'll have to sit for weeks doing calculations. And now you can just have a computer do it. And so now, 
the professor can think of more ideas, the grad students can progress on the papers, they can use the computer programs, and the whole science accelerates. And so that's really what what computers do. But I, I'm a huge, if anyone thinks that they can automate things, I am very skeptical. And that's my background, like my background is building tools to automate things. And I'm very skeptical. But when you have this balance, where the people are doing the jobs that people are really good for, but the computer programs that you're running are working with you to enforce the rules to be able to take off a lot of the work to be able to act as a very good checklist reminder. It's a perfect partnership. And it will, I think it will always be the case. And anyone who tries to over automate things, it's kind of doomed to failure. And anyone who under automates things um, is sort of left behind. And the trick is to find that balance all the time based on the level of technology. But I mean, artificial intelligence technology these days is, is quite amazing, that you can start to provide image classification, crater counting, um, find really small signals in enormous amounts of, of data. And it's just going to continue on into the future. But humans will still be running the show. Until obviously, the robot uprising, and we all merge with our computers and after the singularity, but you know, until then. More questions in a second. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons, Charles Eubanks, Henrik Bo Anderson, tomorrow, Walter Palmer, Eric Lunen and the rest of our 834 patrons for their generous support. Want our videos early with no ads? Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. Visto Tutti. If Venus has a biological system, will the planned probes have the ability to detect life? The current missions that are heading to Venus, there's the Da Vinci Plus mission and the Veritas mission, and neither of those are really going to have the ability to search for life on Venus. Veritas is going to be an orbiter. It's going to be scanning the surface, doing a much more detailed observation. The Da Vinci Plus is going to plunge through the atmosphere and take snapshots of the atmosphere all the way down. And of course, the European Space Agency has announced their own Venus mission as well. That's also going to participate in doing a very detailed scan of the of the atmosphere and the surface of Venus. But no, none of those are going to be capable of continuing on the search for life on Venus, we're going to need a pretty special follow on mission to do that. I haven't heard of any that are in the works. I know that some people have proposed some ideas, but I haven't heard of anyone very seriously taking on the idea that yeah, we're going to send a mission to Venus to search for phosphine and other elements. But I think the search for life is going to be really, really complicated. Just as it's been complicated at Mars, it's going to be even more complicated at, at Venus because just how harsh the conditions are on Venus. I mean, here we are, right? The Viking probes landed on Mars back in the 70s. So we're like 40 years after Vikings landed on Mars with instruments on board attempting to detect life, and we still don't have a definitive answer of whether or not there's life on Mars. So then when you think about Venus, it's that complicated, but also in hell. And so to try to float around in the cloud tops, have a balloon mission, be able to sample the various chemicals to be able to do any kind of analysis, be able to send that data home. No, no, nothing that's in the works right now is going to be able to do that. But I have done an episode, I'm sure you've seen it on various aerial missions that could go to Venus. And there's even an idea for a human mission to Venus that would float in the cloud tops and try to to do some of this kind of science. So maybe in the next few decades, someone will be able to do this. Steve Coates, could you make a repeating gravity wave generator? Well, sure. There, I just made a repeating gravity wave gravitational wave generator whenever uh, you move mass in space, uh, you are generating gravitational waves. So if you wanted to make something that was detectable over long periods of time, you just need to have something that was moving more rapidly that contained more mass, like a couple of neutron stars or black holes orbiting around each other. But the problem is, is that when they get to the point that they're really starting to generate gravitational waves that are detectable over long distances, they are spiraling inward and they're about to merge. So can we somehow move a mass like a black hole um, 
without it merging with another black hole in some way, it just seems like very, very difficult. But who knows, you know, might be that as we get better and better at detecting gravitational waves in the future, we'll get to the point where instead of just detecting, say, the black holes, one minute before they collide with each other, we'll be able to detect them decades, centuries before they collide with each other. And so maybe some alien civilization could figure out a way to, to make those black holes wobble in such a way to be able to release gravitational waves. Um, but then of course, you could just like, shine a light shine a laser beam at someone to communicate if that's what you were, you were trying to do. So yeah, Jeff Sonderman. Hey, Fraser, what current piece of today's conventional wisdom about space and astronomy do you think is most likely to be disproven by science later on? That's a difficult question for me to really answer. Um, because I'm like, I'm really in the weeds on this. And so when I think about something like say, dark matter, I don't think about dark matter as just like, here's this weird mystery that astronomers don't know about. I think about it like all of the different pieces of evidence that have been gathered so far to explain dark matter, all of the ways that they use observations, all of the different theories that have been proposed to be able to try to explain it, all of the different experiments that can be done down here on Earth to search for particles, various astronomical searches for it, like it's this, it's this very complicated nebulous thing. And every astronomical thing that I think about, when I think about fast radio bursts, so I think about dark energy, or I think about any of these things, they all exist in this very complicated, sort of multi dimensional reality. And when things advance, they tend to advance very slowly. So you sort of don't notice this, this change. Um, you know, Pamela and I with with astronomy cast, we went back and you know, every, every decade or so we we do a, a series of episodes where we look back and sort of think about like, what's changed since we started doing astronomy cast. And there aren't a lot of big things like, like there aren't big, um, like big dramatic changes that have happened even in the 15 years that we've been doing this show. But there's a lot of little ones that build up to ones that kind of in retrospect sort of seem really big. But people just want to ask us like, what's the big change that's happened? That's overturned? And I can't think of any, like, I think dark energy was the last big discovery that that caused a, a deep issue. And maybe the the cosmological crisis, this mismatch of measurements between the acceleration of the universe or the expansion of the universe between the the Big Bang and and more recent measurements. So it's it's a tough thing for me. Like, I don't want to weasel out of the question. But but I just find like, in general, the more that I learn, the more that I know, the more people I talk to, everything just becomes shades of gray and nuance. And it's really hard to then go, this is conventional wisdom, and it's totally wrong. Um, so yeah, I don't. Uh, and I also sort of feel pretty humble, like, like, I'm just a journalist. I'm not an astronomer. And so I don't sit there and do research and come up with theories that or even work in those kinds of circles. I'm, I'm following behind attempting to recommunicate the things that people are discovering and learning bit by bit. And so I try not to hold an opinion so much about this kind of stuff. So uh, there you go. I guess I guess the the one that I've stated many times is that I don't think we'll find life in the universe, which I think if you ask most scientists, they think we'll eventually find life in the universe. And I don't think we will. So I guess I guess that's the the most controversial belief that I hold. Eric one, given the current age of the sun and the fact that it will eventually swell up to a red giant, how much longer should the Earth be habitable? Yeah, so the sun is heating up. And it's not just because it, the sun has hit that red giant phase, but actually the sun is heating up day by day, week by week, year by year. And what's happening is inside the sun, it's converting hydrogen into helium. And this helium is forming this layer on the outside of the core of the sun, that is causing the amount of essentially the size of the sun to increase a little bit causing the amount of energy that the sun is releasing to go up. And this is increasing the total energy output of the sun a little bit that's increasing slowly. And this has been going on really for the lifetime of the sun so far, and it's going to continue on. And the bad news is, 
that that this increased uh, heating from the sun is going to cook the earth more like about 500 million to about a billion years. So even though the sun itself is going to take like five more billion years until it runs out of fuel in the core and turns into a red giant, it will have actually already blasted life off of Earth within about 500 million to a billion years from now. So uh, within about a billion years, the oceans will have boiled and there will be no hospitable place on the surface of the Earth for life anymore. Um, now this has nothing to do with global warming. Uh, it's way slower than that. So this is a but sort of a long term existential issue that that I guess, you know, we or the octopuses that take over will have to figure this out. But it's kind of interesting. When you when you think about it, Earth has been habitable by large life forms by animals and stuff for about 500 million to a billion years. And, and will so we're at like the halfway point of the Earth's productive large animal period, and that will phase out again. And the earth will essentially just be teeming with microbes underneath the surface until the sun does finally turn into a red giant and blast the planet. Hal McKinney with discovering life outside of Earth seeming to be the biggest driver of space exploration. What's the second biggest motivation? I think I want to argue with the premise of your question in the first place. I don't think that discovering life outside of Earth is really the biggest driver of, of space exploration. I'd say the biggest driver is being able to make life better on Earth. That's like the biggest driver of, of space exploration. When you think about all of the rockets, all of the work that's being done, it's to send up GPS satellites, communication satellites, military satellites, like we learn to go to space so that we can use the benefits of space down here on Earth. And that I think is like the first motivation to getting good at space exploration. And then I would say beyond that, it's to understand the solar system, both at a planetary at a high energy physics to sort of like all the various levels with life actually being pretty far down the list. I mean, there's really only one robot in the entire solar system right now, whose job is even barely has anything to do with life. And that is perseverance, like it has some capability to try to search for the conditions of life in the ancient past and currently on Mars. And maybe with its microscope, it could detect something that sort of looks like life. But beyond that, there really hasn't been much of an attempt to search for life. In fact, it's sort of it's kind of forbidden. It's for the longest time, saying that you were looking for life was the fastest way to not get any research funding for your for your proposal. It's only in the last couple of years that that serious attempts like the field of astrobiology serious attempts to look for life on other worlds is being considered a good thing, a, a worthwhile goal, the kind of thing that can get funding. So so I would go like, we explore space to make life better on Earth, we explore space to understand the solar system, and then a bunch of other stuff and then search for life. Sid Parashar. Hey, Fraser, with James Webb, is it possible that the radius of the universe can increase in all directions? And what will James Webb's qualities be? No, James Webb will not be able to let us see any farther into the universe than any previous telescope. In fact, like back in the 1960s, when they detected the cosmic microwave background radiation, that was the farthest observation that we will ever be able to make with telescopes. And this is a point where the light was released about 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And before that, the entire universe was like the inside of a star, it was opaque, you couldn't see through it. And so it's not like with a better telescope, you can just see farther into this sphere around the Earth. Literally, we already can see the farthest that we can see and it is this wall of the beginning of the universe we can see all of the bits in between with higher resolution with better telescopes, but we'll never be able to see all the way beyond that because it's the beginning of time. And we can't see before the beginning of time. Nathan Conklin, any thoughts on the similarity of strings in the standard model when compared to filaments of the cosmic web similarity of quantum probability distribution compared to cosmic background radiation? 
so sometimes things just look the same. It's like a coincidence. Another example of that is like the similarity of the large scale structure of the universe to the neuron pathways of the brain. But when you have like in the case of the universe, you've got gravity pulling things and concentrating things in a way that is very similar to if a you know brain is attempting or a slime mold is attempting to to grab as much space with the minimum amount of volume possible, then you get those similar shapes. And so, you know, a lot of times we see similarities in various parts of physics, and they're just a coincidence. So, uh, you know, I don't know if there's any deeper meaning in those coincidences. So um, I'm not often the right person to ask that question to. Natuspin 900, what do you think is the future of space propulsion systems? I think chemical rockets are going to be with us for a long time. They do the job. And as we move out into space and we think about possibly gathering our resources locally, there's nothing simpler than taking water ice, splitting it with electricity into hydrogen and oxygen, pressurizing them, and then you've got a liquid oxygen rocket system like the space shuttle. There are some other propulsion systems which are great, like ion engines, which allow you to have a sort of higher top speed in the end with a lower amount of mass used up, but they have very slow rates of acceleration. So they have their, their downsides, although the Chinese have put a ion system onto their space station, which is kind of cool. Um, so I, no, I don't think that we're going to see any large developments in propulsion systems for a long time. There are other ideas to give you, you know, obviously, nuclear rockets can give you a higher specific impulse. But there are downsides to launching nuclear reactors to space. So I, I think the future of propulsion for a long time, like for decades, maybe 100 years is going to be just different versions of chemical rockets. But, but sort of like the like the car engine, right? The, the gasoline engine has been used for a long time, because it works really well. And you can imagine space being a similar situation. All right, well, those are the questions this week. Uh, thank you, everybody who joined me live and also asked offline. Again, if you want to join the show live, come every Monday at 5pm Pacific time and uh, join the chat and ask your question and even follow up questions. It's a lot of it's a lot of fun. All right, we'll see you next week. If you want a single comprehensive resource for space news, you'll want to subscribe to my weekly email newsletter. Every Friday, I send out a magazine of space news with dozens of stories, pictures, brief highlights about the story and links you can find out more. Go to universetoday.com newsletter to sign up. It's totally free. And did you know that all of my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format so that you can have the latest episodes as well as special bonus material like interviews with me show up on your audio device. Go to universetoday.com slash audio or search for Universe Today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll put a link in the show notes. Thanks, as always, to the moderators and a special thanks to Chad Weber and Nancy Graziano.